So, right, in the uh, second half, um, which you very kindly agreed to, um, I'm going to introduce you to um, Wojciech of of Jarski. Oh, thank you very much. And um, he's from the University of Gdansk, and he's written a great deal and has been involved with the uh, Shakespearean project in Gdansk, I believe, and uh, published a great deal on the nature of consciousness in literature and dreams. And he's going to talk to us today for half an hour, I believe. You take half an hour and then we'll have questions afterwards. And he's going to talk about, but who is that on the other side of you, the demonic source of consciousness in literature and dreams. So thank you very much. We we'll look forward to it. Uh, this paper is mainly about you. But let us begin with A. In one of uh, the novels, The Wasteland, the poet writes, The following lines were stimulated by the account uh, of one of the uh, Antarctic expeditions. I forget which, but I think one of Shepherd. It was related that the part of explorers at the extremity of this trend had the constant delusion that there was, uh, that, that there was one more member that could actually become. An explorer's account inspired Elliot to write one of his best known stanzas. And now, please forgive me, my English, I know it is a kind of a read it. I'm sorry. Uh, who is the fact that walks always beside you? When I come, there are only you and I together. But when I look at the white road, there is always another one walking beside you. Gliding raft in a brown mantle, who did? I do not know whether a man or a woman. But who is that on the other side of you? The demonic sensation of the prevalence of a, a third one has been transferred from the realm of the anecdota to the dimension of personal experiences. Keeping track of the anxieties of influence, Harold Bloom recognized Walt Whiteman in Elliot's demon and claimed that Elliot's third, uh, who always walks beside you, is either Whiteman's uh, thought of death or knowledge of death, or both views together. The wasteland begins to seem more an energy for the poet's own genius rather than a lament for Western civilization. Moreover, according, uh, according to Bloom, the wasteland reflects Elliot's personal breakdown in 1921, a reaction to the strain of his first marriage. Unquote. Without venturing into biographical details, one can assume that in uh, this case, literature, uh, as it often does, served as a medium. Fantasizing about Shackleton's story and reworking it into the literary form of his poem, Elliot was trying to tame his own demon. It appears that this particular demonic stanza of Elliot's perfectly fits in with what Georges Poulet called the pint of departure. When studying texts of the authors I'm interested in, Poulet wrote, I'm trying to discover especially the way in which uh, the one who reveals himself in them specifies his point of departure in a flash of self-awareness, thus formulating the cogito. It is the search for such places, places where the cogito of the writer is formulated, that I consider a particularly compelling and useful practice, especially in the face of our irrevocably lost fight in the stability and tangibility of the subject. It so happens that I usually find Pulesian points of departure, uh, where a literary text per uh, permits uh, the fabric of a dream. This is not the case with Eliot's text, uh, though that too the demon uh, has a clearly honorary character. The literary accounts of dreams, even if the, dream, uh, the dreams described are not authentic, offer an insight into the way in which the subject comes to terms with him or herself. In such circumstances, the element of self-discovery is usually inseparably, inseparably uh, it went, uh, with the element of self-creation, so that the two cannot be distinguished or disconnected from each other. At this point, at this point it is time to finally refer to Jung, and following him put forth the big question, who or what is the author of a dream? Uh, before I do that, however, I would like to demonstrate in what sense a literary description of a dream may serve as a point of departure for the constituting subject. I will use the example of a Polish writer, Witold Gombrowicz. In the opening scene of his first novel, Ferd Durke, published just before the war, 
The 30-year-old protagonist gives an account of his dream of a doppelganger, and I quote now. Uh, the dream took me back to my youth, and I saw myself as I was at 15 or 16, standing on a rock near a mill by a river, my face to the wind, and, and I heard myself saying something. I heard my long, furry, rooster-like, squeaky little voice. I saw my, feature, my features, they were not yet fully uh, formed, my nose was too small, my hands that were too large. I felt the uh, unpleasant texture of intermediate pacing phase of development. I woke up laughing and terrified by both, because I thought that the 30-year-old man I am today was aping and ridiculing the color juvenile I once, I once was, while he <coughs> was aping me and, by the same token, each of us was aping himself. Further, as I lay awake but still had dreaming, I felt that my body was not homogeneous, that some parts were still those of a boy, and that my head was laughing at my leg and ridiculing it, that my leg was laughing at my head, that my finger was poking fun at my heart, my heart of my brain, that my nose was thumping itself at my eye, my head chuckling and blowing at my nose, and all my parts were widely raping each other in an all-encompassing and piercing state of fun mockery. Nor did my fear lessen on Yota when I reached full consciousness and began reflecting on my life." Unquote. The process of the formulation of the cogito taking place in this dream turns out to result from a clash of various forces. Firstly, we can distinguish a tension between the eye of the present time and the eye from the past. Neither of them is the final, true or superior eye. The subject of the dream seems to be suspended between them, not as a compromise reached once and for all, but rather as a phenomenon in constant move in a never-ending practice of mutual parodies and mirror reflections. Secondly, we are struck by the playful squabbles of particular body parts. In light of psychoanalysis and depth psychology, they may be understood as symbols of antagonist aspects of the psyche. The subject emerging from the dream is far from any kind of stability. Thirdly, uh, what seems highly significant is the, relation, uh, the relations between the dreamer and the dream teller. As is well known to literary critics, representing by far all methodological orientations, the storyteller is never the same as the one about whom the story is being told, even if he seems to be uh, speaking about himself. As is probably known to all psychotherapists, the dreamer is not the same as the one uh, he dreams about, even though the former usually recognizes himself in the letter. Thus, in literary descriptions of dreams, the whole situation is extremely complex and interesting. Some eye talks about some other eye, which dreams uh, about yet another eye, even though uh, to an untried eye it might look as if there was just one person involved. And this is where the little third one comes into play. When I dream, one could attempt a travesty of the poet's words. There are only you and I together, but when I wake up, there is always another one. In Gondrovich's novel, the third one telling about the honoric experience, marks detachment from the dream, from the dream by means of humorous narration. Uh, the atmosphere of pan mockery underlines laughter and fear alike, because the domain uh, becomes the domain of a subjectivity in constant move, ungraspable non-definable, specifying itself paradoxically, though its non-specificity. Such a vision of the subject, characteristic of all later works of Gombrowicz, and also typical of the images uh, prevalent of, in our contemporary identity discourse, has emerged, let us emphasize this, in the situation of dream recounting. And now it is really high time to evoke Jung, for it was he who most eagerly inquired after the nature of the dreaming subject. But please, please allow, uh, allow me uh, one last brief uh, remark. As we know, Gaston Bachelard used to call dream a black hole, claiming that there is no point searching for any subject in it. Mother Boss, on the other hand, argued that the subject of a dream is wholly identical with the subject of waking life uh, activities. Today, this view is advocated by cognitivists, though for totally different reasons. Juxtaposed with, with such extremes, Jungian thought inspires much more tempting and sophisticated speculations. In Memories, Dreams, Reflections, Jung thus deliberated on this possible source of his childhood dream. I quote, 
Who was it speaking in me? Whose mind had devised them? What kind of superior intelligence was at work? Who thought of problems far beyond my knowledge? Who brought the above and below together and uh, laid the foundation for everything that was to fill the second half of my life with strongest passion? And Jung offered an answer. Who but the alien guest who came both from above and from below? Most likely, Jung was convinced of the existence of that alien guest from the very beginning of his scientific activity. Though he gave it different names and offered different explanations of its functioning. In uh, 1929, still feeling a strong need to radically distance himself from Freud, he taught his seminar students, I quote, Freud considers dream to be a fully rational uh, formation. I believe it is an irrational fact, something that just happens. The dream enters our consciousness like an animal. Imagine I am sitting in the forest and suddenly, suddenly there appears a deer. We don't like to return to animal imagery, especially in his somewhat later seminars on children's dreams. In 1938, he explained, when something is plugging us in a dream, it means that thing desperately wants to establish a connection with us. When you dream that a bull, a lion, or a wolf is chasing you, it means that this something wants to confront you. In that case, the most optimal attitude could be summed up as follows. Very well, come on and eat me. Another seminar from the same series features the image of a third person. A dream should be always convinced of, Jung explained, as a kind of a conversation breaking into a radio program you are listening to, or into your telephone conversation. You are talking uh, with somebody or listening to the radio, and suddenly there is a third person joining. You hear one sentence and the conversation breaks again. Unquote. It is common knowledge that Jung was very deeply convinced about the aut autonomy of the unconscious. He used to point to the fact time and again and illustrated it with numerous examples. It is no wonder then that he also treated dreams as autonomous. The whole secret of dreams, he told his seminar students, lies in the fact that we, that we do not dream them, but that dreams dream themselves. Man is the victim of a dream, not his outro. Unquote. When we begin to think, however, what exactly follows from the autonomy of dream, there arises a problem. A problem. Uh, what was Jung's idea of that alien gas appearing in dreams? After all, a leon or a wolf, uh, to which we can say, very well, hit me, uh, are quite different from the third person who suddenly breaks in during a telephone conversation. In the guest, uh, is a guest uh, a blind and instinctive force then, or rather an intelligent and self-aware one? Does it have any intentions towards the dreamer, or is it uh, so highly autonomous that it does not mind the dreamer at all? It seems that Jung gave contradictory answers to these and similar questions. <laughs> yes. In one of the seminars, he claimed, we must not think that dreams have any kind of intentions towards us. While uh, less than a month later, he was proving that a girl's dream, which he was analyzing, tries to prevent a danger. In his own dreams, uh, he even found a warning tactic. As you see, a dream is not always a mere thoughtless deal. I want to state, to state very firmly that I am as far as possible from the idea of nitpicking about Jung's inconsistencies. Sniffing out contradictions or logical deficiencies in the work of a visionary thing that had been developing his ideas over the span of many years and in many different fields would amount to contemplate pettiness and common stupidity. In fact, Jung was treated that way more than once. What I'm interested in is rather the antinomy and ambiguity uh, of Jung's philosophy, features of which he was, after all, well aware. In the case of dreams, the antinomy manifests itself especially in the question uh, of the extent to which they are autonomous from the dreamer. It seems that Jung saw the author of a dream in a number of various instances, in the content of the individual, individual unconscious, in the compensatory activity of a weaker feature, in a personified uh, autonomous complex, in the collective sphere of an archetype. As we know, he embraced no scientific 
images, speaking of a fight as a casual factor of dream, and of course referring also to demon possession. Thus, there was a wide spectrum of possibilities. A dream might have proved autonomous from the conscious eye, from the individual dimensions uh, of the psyche in both its conscious and unconscious aspect, but also uh, looking from a different perspective, from the human per uh, perception of time, given that, I quote, the unconscious always remains somewhat, uh, somewhat aside of the chronological order, uh, perceiving things which have not happened yet. A good illustration of the antinomy, uh, antinomy of Jungian psychology of dream is offered by the following example. In 2099, Jung claimed, Since I do not know those who dreamed, I can only venture a theoretical interpretation, for there is no foothold for interpretation proper. Nine years later, he stated something quite opposite. I quote, The only satisfactory way of explaining dreams is the objective method. There is no need to refer to the dreamer's personal association. Well then, we may ask, does one need associations to interpret dreams or not? Is dream to some extent related to the dreamer's individual life, or does it come uh, from a realm uh, wholly independent of the dreamer? Bearing in mind uh, the whole of Jung's all, we will of course easily reach the conclusion that this is a false alternative, as there simply exist different dreams, some related to the individual unconscious, others rooted in the collective unconscious. The latter, which Jung used to call great dreams, do not bring any associations and can be explained only through ethnological amplification. And yet, formulating the above quoted assertions, Jung seems not to have admitted to, to existence or the existence of any exceptions of the rule. Now he said yes, now he said no. And this is, I believe, the most interesting, interesting thing about him. His antinomy never turned into dialectic. It had nothing to do with Hegelian synthesis. The conjunctio oppositorum, he so often described, took place in the world of his ideas as if beyond uh, the explicit flow of argumentation. It can only be appreciated from a distance, not from within. If we are too short-sighted or too literal in reading Kuhn, sooner or later he will lead us up the garden path. At this point, it is impossible to escape uh, to the fundamental question. How are we to read Jung today? I shall narrow the question to the field of dreams. Can Jungian concept of dream prove useful for those who study dreams in the second decade of the 21st century? <clears throat> the architects of the most popular um, movements in contemporary dream studies treated Jung quite mercilessly indeed. Neuropsychologists such as Alan Hobson are obviously not going to deal with things like archetype or luminosum, nor are cognitivists or followers of the quantitative approach. According to G. William Domov, I quote, if there are more similarities than differences between dreaming and waking cognition, then there may be only small changes when alert waking thought turns into a dream. Therefore, the key issue is not the expression of archetypal symbols loaded within an inherited collective unconscious as in Jungian theory. Nor is there any support for Jung's well-known idea uh, that most dreams uh, have a compensatory function. Every relevant systematic studies suggest that uh, most dream content is continuous with waking thought or personality rather than compensatory. Unquote. Such arguments can be easily refuted by proving that, first of all, Jung did not deny the, cons the connection between dream and waking uh, thought, and secondly, Quantitative research does not exclude the absence of such connections in some cases. It is not by contemporary dream studies that Jung dream theory can be seriously challenged, but rather by contemporary philosophy. Seen from this point of view, Jung committed the deadly sin of essentialism, of the fight in universal phenomena, in the permanent essence of things, the unchangeability of types, uh, types and patterns. In, this, uh, in the eyes of the constructivists, or broadly speaking, postmodernists, Jung must appear to be a tenacious apostle of the metaphysics of the presence. The Jungian subject, determinedly integrating disassembled fragments of psyche in the process of individuation and trying to reach fullness or wholeness, is a vision placing itself at the very opposite pole to our contemporary discourses, 
which speak of the subject in terms of a nebula, difference, or tribes. How are we then to utilize Jung's achievements without disregarding or exorcising demons of humanistic thought, such as Heidegger, Derrida, Foucault, Deleuze, Lacan, or Rorty? I cannot, of course, offer an exhaustive answer to this question. What I will insist on is simply the fact that today Jung's philosophy can be precisely utilized, or, as no pragmatists have it, it can be used. After all, and I believe we do agree on that, Jung still fascinates and impresses us. Kelly Barclay, one of the most prominent contemporary dream researchers, writes that Jung's seminar on children's dreams will not convince those who question Jung's assumptions uh, about the universality of the archetypes, but for those who already appreciate and value Jungian dream theory, children's dreams will be a cause, will be a cause for joy. I am quite positive that Jung's works uh, can be a cause for joy, not only for, him, uh, for his admirers, but also for the doubting souls. And if Jung gives us joy, he must be useful. All we need to do is, as Rorty would put it, including in our final vocabulary. In fact, Jung is actually asking for it. His way of argumentation of many occasions resembles the rhetoric of pragmatism. Let us have a look at one of the passages from Memories, Dreams, Reflections, central to the question of demons and dreams. It was quoted partly today, but I will give the last one. So I quote. Uh, we know that something unknown, alien, does come our way, just as we know that we do not ourselves make a dream or an impression, but that somehow arises of its own accord. What does happen to us in this manner can be said to emanate from mama, from a demon, or a god, or the unconscious. The first three times have the great merit of including and evoking the emotional quality of luminosity, whereas the latter, the unconscious, is banal and therefore closer to reality. Hence, I prefer the term the unconscious, knowing that I might equally well speak of God or demon if I wish to express myself in mythic language. When I do use such mythic language, I am aware that mama, demon, and God are synonyms for the unconscious, that is to say we know just as much or just as little about them as about the latter. People only believe that they know much more about them, and for certain purposes, they believe uh, that belief is far more useful and effective than a scientific concept. And the great advantage of the concept demon or god lies uh, in making possible a much better objectification of the vis-a-vis, -vis, namely a personification of it. Unquote. This excerpt, unlike many earlier texts, does not present Jung as someone who intends to ascertain the essence of things. On the contrary, here, Jung seems to be inviting us to choose the character of the discourse, depending on its usefulness and profitability for our purposes. The profitable conclusion we can draw from the above quoted passage does not have, the, uh, does not have take the shape of the dialectic assertion that mana, demon, god, and the unconscious are just different names of the same phenomenon. But neither does it have to be the, rat the relativist conclusion, namely that choosing one of these words we also choose the reality in which we are going to operate. It would seem much more useful to read Jung's reflection as the questioning of divisions firmly grounded in the philosophical tradition, subject versus subject, inside versus outside, the imminent, uh, the, the imminent versus the transcendent. The notion of the collective unconscious, ours, for we are immersed in it, and yet not belonging to us, for it is supra-individual, the notion of participation mystique, the notion of synchronicity. These are Jungian phantasmata of overstepping the binary divisions of traditional philosophy. One could imagine a reading of Jung in which the subject of a dream would appear identical and yet at the same time non-identical with itself. We can assume that the autonomous character, uh, autonomous sorry, character of Jung's thinking, his own inconsistencies, whether true or seeming, his uh, weakness for paradoxes, the inexhaustible in ingenuity allowing him to place phenomena in and describe them from a yet new perspectives, all reflect the desire to invalidate the fundamental question of whether our demons, in dreams and not only that, come from within our psyche or from without. 
Uh, in this light, the relations between the dreaming subject and the alien guests possessing it would be neither a projection nor a personification, nor a paranormal phenomenon. They would be a dynamic interplay of incessantly different exchanging and never finally differentiated images of the eye, non central or privileged, all real and autonomous. Such reading of Jung definitely proves profitable for the interpretation of points of departure, in particular those of the broader of literature and dream. Let us return to Gombrowicz's novel. A man who does not want to grow up and dreams about himself as a boy immediately brings to mind the Jungian archetype of poor Eternus. In the literary account of the dream, however, he will not be able to pinpoint anything which would resemble a confrontation with the archetype in the vein of the dreamer standing face to face with the image of this eternal boy. On the contrary, as we have already noticed, the subject is not confronted with anything at all, but rather constitutes himself only thanks to the confrontation of his own images, constantly mocking one another and deforming. The notion of poor eternus is certainly helpful for understanding the situation of the dreamer, but not if defined as a universal perennial pattern coming from the depth of the collective unconscious and taking possession of the protagonists. Nor is it uh, of much use if treated as a mere personification of the protagonist's individual characteristics. It can be helpful only when understood as a phenomenon freed from the alternative of inside-outside, as a most unstable matrix, existent and at the same time postulated, as an image which reveals and at the same time produces itself. Used in this way, Jungian thought should prove extremely helpful for the understanding of many dreams of today and many contemporary literary texts. And perhaps it would even help to tame the Eliot on thought.